Hello and welcome to The Download, our show to bring you all the latest in Catholic news and discussion. I'm Stephen Wynn. Also on set today is Christine Niles. Hello, Christine. Hey, Stephen. A lot of, lot of news to cover today. Uh, that's, that's right. We're going to be on top of it. Uh, also with us is Brad Eli. Hello, Hi, Brad. How are you doing? All right. As you're probably aware, there's a huge amount of news, a steady nonstop flow. And what we do on the download is try to show you how all these various events are interrelated. But before you see the connections, you first need to know the stories. So here, is a here are some of today's stories making headlines. A relic is stolen. A prominent cardinal warns the priesthood is in danger. And an icon showing our Lord with AIDS is featured in Los Angeles. Christine. All right. A relic of St. John Henry Newman has been stolen. The relic is the only piece of Newman's bones that survived decomposition in the grave. It went missing from a shrine to the saint, located at the Birmingham Oratory in London, where Newman once lived. The British Cardinal, a convert from Anglicanism, was canonized last October. In a newsletter Sunday, the fathers and brothers of the oratory asked the public for any information on the relic's whereabouts. In other news, Cardinal Robert Seurat says the priesthood is in mortal danger. In a recent interview, the African Cardinal sounded the alarm and the threat to priestly celibacy posed by the Amazon Synod. This comes after backlash to his book titled From the Depths of Our Hearts, in which Cardinal Seurat and Pope Benedict defended the celibate priesthood. The Cardinal said of his critics, quote, they know their arguments are based on historical errors, on theological misunderstandings, close quote. And, a priest who painted a gay crucifixion will be featured at the L.A. Religious Education Congress. William Hart McNichols, a Jesuit priest and iconographer, has frequently incorporated LGBT messaging into his works. For instance, he's depicted our crucified savior as an AIDS victim. It was recently brought to light that his work will be given prominence at this year's Religious Education Congress, an event notorious for being a platform for theological dissent and liturgical abuse. It's such, it's, I mean, the LA Rec is such a scandal every single year, and yeah. Archbishop Gomez does absolutely nothing about it. And he's right. been approached multiple times about this privately and publicly, and he's, he's always like, oh, yes, you know, I'll, I'll take your concerns into consideration, and then nothing's ever changed. They bring in heretic, I mean, outright heretical speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, Bishop Barron, who's auxiliary bishop in LA, never breathes a word of reproach, and same guy who wants to impose an, uh, you know, imprimatur on people who teach the faith online, and yet he won't say a thing about the heresy and dissent that's being openly propagated mm -hmm. at the LA Rec. You know, that second, or that third story actually about the priest and the iconographer making a, a gay Jesus, basically, <laughs> is uh, highlighting the point that Sarah is making in that second story. Mm -hmm. He's saying the priesthood is in mortal danger, and that priest, the iconographer there, it just accentuates that point very clearly. And it's not just about celibacy. Celibacy is one of the issues. But it's actually what Sarah is talking about is their formation is devoid of God. They're not being formed to be God-centered and relying on God. And he said all that's left is this power struggle after that. So he's saying if you don't correct, and you know what? Those guys go on to become bishops. And he said this sex abuse scandal is just a symptom. Oh, yeah of the problem that they're not acting in supernatural faith or, or, or actions aren't rooted in yeah. God. Mm -hmm. So they're as if they have no faith or they have no faith. Either way, it's just as bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he's saying is the problem with the more, and, and the celibacy is just one more clamoring of mm -hmm. uh, just another sign that this is, is the case. And I, I mean, I just, I think back, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, there was a, a great scandal over a secular artist who compiled a, he made a painting, painted a painting, uh, depicting a crucifix submerged in a jar of urine. Mm -hmm. It was called P. Christ. And the church was in an uproar over, you know, over that at that time. And here we are just, <clears throat> you know, a little over a decade later, maybe two, and we're having we're having a, a priest who paints something that's, and frankly, I think just as sacrilegious, just as blasphemous. We're actually having him featured at a at a, at a Catholic uh, education congress. It's just it just really is testimony to how yeah, quickly it's unbelievable, yeah. all, and all of it's interconnected. I mean, you know what Sarah is saying that this is really fundamentally this whole sex abuse crisis and all this stuff. Fundamentally, it's a crisis of faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've said it so many times. The bishops. Many of them have just lost all supernatural faith. So this comes down also to the question of Canon 915, which we'll, we'll be discussing later on as well, giving Holy Communion to pro-abortion politicians, to people in you know, same-sex unions, things like that. You know, the reason so many of these bishops don't 
care really so much about that. You just had Bishop Sarando, right, giving communion in the Vatican yeah. to someone yes. living in open adultery. Yeah, the president you know, and he, of Argentina. He came out and said, well, he's not excommunicated, therefore I can do this. Well, no, I think mm -hmm. fundamentally it's, you don't really believe that's really the body and blood of Christ. 915 doesn't hinge on excommunication. No, not at notorious all. Notorious sin or notorious, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's completely wrong-headed. I mean, 915, um, it makes it mandatory to deny Holy Communion to any manifest grave sinner, meaning a public sinner, right. someone who's causing scandal by his public sin and who has not repented or anything like that. It has nothing to do with excommunication. Well, that goes back to what Sarah was talking about. You know, you get all these priests who are acting with no faith. Well, look at the Vatican. You get this Paglia, the erotic Jesus and all this type of stuff. You're not going to get correction coming from the top down yeah. uh, because too many of those hippie priests became bishops. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, that's a recap of some of today's headlines. When we come back, the shell game. Many bishops are resorting to to avoid sex abuse payouts. Stick around, we'll be right back. The peasant Catholics can no longer trust the Church of Nice establishment media. Get daily updates and become the informed Catholic you need to be. Download the all new Church Militant app from Google Play or the Apple App Store. Very little, besides actual sex abuse, angers faithful Catholics more about clerical homosexual abuse than the financial malfeasance that also has been exposed. Whether it's cases like Bishop Michael Bransfield of West Virginia, who stole millions from his diocese, the poorest in the nation, while also going after seminarians, or pro-gay bishops who have protected predator priests while lavishing themselves with luxurious homes or extravagant vacations. Catholics are closing their wallets, sick of being essentially stolen from. The increasing payouts and lower revenues are taking their toll on many dioceses, which are now having to get creative in managing their monies. Our own Michael Boris has this overview. As fewer Catholics attend Mass and various legal claims continue to mount, U.S. bishops are secretly squirreling away assets, putting them out of the reach of jury awards. New York Cardinal Timothy Dolan was blasted in media reports for stashing away $60 million in the Milwaukee Archdiocese Cemetery Fund when he was Archbishop there. Last year, Detroit Archbishop Alan Vigneron's shifting around of church assets was the subject of an article in the Detroit News. In Detroit, Vigneron quietly transferred nearly all of the Archdiocese property into a newly created nonprofit called Mooney Real Estate Holdings in an effort to shelter it from legal awards. U.S. bishops more and more are following suit, aware of the potential for enormous payouts looming down the road as various states lift the statute of limitations on sex abuse claims. While legal, various critics are calling the actions unethical, even immoral, because the actions are designed to severely limit a diocese's financial exposure potentially cheating victims out of some of what they are owed. Another tactic, sometimes necessary, is for a diocese to declare bankruptcy and submit for reorganization, effectively defaulting on money owed to debtors as well as victims. Bishops are usually loath to actually sell off property or land holdings to meet financial obligations, but a few have found themselves left with little alternative. But that has raised the hackles of faithful Catholics, upset that the church's patrimony is being sold to the highest bidder to pay off debts for clerical misdeeds. The crisis of homosexuality in the clergy, which has to date cost the church in the U.S. a collective nearly $4 billion, is now having a further knock-on effect, causing bishops to now find more financially creative ways to hide their assets making them appear to be even more underhanded than they appear to be for allowing the crisis in the first place. Michael Voris, Church Militant, Detroit. Right, so one of the things that Michael mentioned in his very good uh, news report there is uh, Detroit, what Detroit's doing. Essentially, it's an asset dump. Um, so he mentioned Mooney Real Estate Holdings. So what's taking place now is the Detroit Archdiocese is transferring millions, if not hundreds of millions, of assets into Mooney Real Estate Holdings. What this is, is it's a 501c3 nonprofit with one person at the helm, one person in total control of all of the assets, and that would be the Archbishop, Archbishop Alan Vignon right now. And so you've got um, parishes, schools, 
the, the seminary, um, all religious, charitable, and educational organizations, traditionally you know, owned by the Archdiocese, all being transferred to Mooney Real Estate Holdings, and Archbishop Vignon stands at the top, and he controls all of it. Nothing can be done with any of these assets without his explicit approval. Uh, you can't file bankruptcy without his explicit approval over these assets. Um, and so what this essentially does, people need to be aware, is it shields the assets from all creditors. Creditors can't go after it because this is now under the archbishop's control. Um, sex abuse victims who, who file lawsuits against the archdiocese, they can no longer go after this. Something else, else the archdiocese has been doing as well is um, it's making it now impossible for any sex abuse victims to actually sue the archdiocese anymore. Even if the archbishop was complicit in covering up, for instance, a, a specific priest's wrongdoing and abuse, um, the, the victim can now only go after that priest and his parish, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, each pre parish doesn't have a whole lot of money, they, but they can now no longer go after the archdiocese, which of course has the hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is interesting. The, the law firm that was used to establish Mooney Real Estate Holdings is Bodman. Bodman Law Firm is the, the most expensive, um, most elite law firm in the state of Michigan. They charge the most, and they're also the very same law firm that's defending them against the, the father prone case. Mm. So, Well, I, I think really this does speak to really to the, 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 the financial cost of the abuse, uh, of the abuse scandal. Uh, clearly, they're circling the wagons. They're concerned about the being slammed, as they should be, with, with millions of dollars in, in, in settlements. You know, after, after decades of sexual predation by, by priests, by religious, the financial damage is growing. And 20 months uh, into the, into the, uh, the uh, second wave of the abuse crisis, I think we're really starting to get an idea of how how massive all of this is going to be. You know, $4 billion, Michael said in his report, we're at $4 billion and counting, and that is just going to skyrocket, you know, in the, in the, in the months and the years ahead as more and more states lift their statutes of limitations so to, to allow uh, uh, victims of um, uh, sex abuse to sue. Now, you know, then also, in addition to, to these, these settlements, uh, dioceses are being forced to pay massive amounts and high uh, attorney fees, uh, you know, to basically descend, defend themselves against uh, uh, prosecutors who specialize in clerical sex abuse cases. You know, uh, for example, there's there's Minnesota's Jeff Anderson. I mean, he's he's launched dozens of cases against dioceses across the country, going after predator priests and cover up bishops. And in fact, the situation is getting so bad that many diocesan insurance companies are beginning to revolt. They're just refusing to cover the cost. You know, they say, well, you, you, with your cover up, this is this is premeditated. We're not going we're not going to cover this. And uh, last year, for example, uh, New York. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, he actually sued, launched a lawsuit against 32 uh, insurance companies, uh, diocesan insurance companies, who just refused to cover uh, the cost of, of the settlements. You know, again, they said this is this is you know by, by, by the fact that you were covering up, you were essentially uh, this is premeditated almost. So, um, and, and and he has he has room to be worried. You know, he's facing a tsunami of uh, of lawsuits. You know, all kinds of them are heading his, uh, his way. Um, one of them, uh, uh, James Grind, uh, who uh, really helped blow the lid off the McCarrick uh, scandal. Uh, he's suing uh, both New York and New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, for tens of millions of dollars. I think it's something like in, uh, at least thirty million dollars. But uh, yeah, so so uh, you know, it's no wonder the the, the dioceses are are scrambling. But but again, you know, they pledge transparency, accountability, and instead they start shifting assets. It's just a disgrace. Well, yeah, the end of the line here is the bankruptcy filings, and the bankruptcies are mounting across the country. There's a lot of in the news since uh, 2008 when New York Archdiocese named McCarrick as a credibly accused and then the PA grand jury comes out uh, a couple months later and, and blows the lid off of, of all that network going on. But let's take a look at these dioceses now that have been going on. We have a list here from Portland. This is 2004 filed for bankruptcy in 2004. So that's been going back a while, about 15 years, 16 years. Tucson, Spokane, Davenport, San Diego, Fairbanks, Wilmington, Milwaukee, Gallup, Helena, Stockton, St. Paul, Minneapolis, I think that was 2015 if memory serves, Duluth, Great Falls, Billings, New Ulm, Winona, Guam, Rochester, and Santa Fe have all filed for bankruptcy. There's about 19 there. And Buffalo recently came out, Buffalo Diocese came out uh, about a week and a half ago and said it's imminent that they will be filing. Inside Buzz says within a few weeks, a few more weeks, they'll be filing for bankruptcy. Two misconceptions we need to shoot down here. Bankruptcy for them does not mean they're out of cash at all. And the second misconception is they weren't just blindsided 
all of a sudden and didn't see it coming when all this broke. Let's take a look at Buffalo, zero in here for Buffalo for a minute. In 2005, we all know about the Child Victims Act that passed this last year and went into effect in August. Okay, that blows off the statute of limitations for a year. They have a look back window. You can start suing even though you were time barred prior to that. That first floated through uh, the General Assembly in 2005. One year later, 2006, the diocese then started scrambling and reshuffling re uh, their assets. $91 million got shuffled in 2006, right after they were talking about removing the statute of limitations on sex abuse. So you had, now this is a very important point right here. 2006, the financial report for Buffalo comes out and they said 145 million we have in assets. After the shuffling, they said, oh, we only have 90, uh, we only have 54 million in 2007, their financial report comes out and says, that's all we're accountable for right now. What happened to the money? It went ultimately, first of all, it went to parishes, schools, and cemeteries, and other entities of the diocese. Then they, in turn, turned around and put it in this professionally managed fund called St. Joseph's uh, Investment Fund, which is much like the Cardinal Mooney, uh, Cardinal, uh, the Mooney Estates uh, holding, real estate holdings. Now, the latest financial report, too, does not count 161 parishes, the money they have, 34 elementary schools, and all this stuff, uh, well, bankruptcy the, now. The thing about all this is, you know, all these, um, you know, legal decisions and shielding assets and bankruptcy and all this stuff, you know, the bishops aren't really affected by this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, at the end of the day, it's the faithful who are affected because they're, they're we have to have less, fewer things, you know, um, maybe fewer scholarships for, uh, you know, parish schools, tuition assistance, you know, charities, things like that, because the bishops are busy having to pay off these sex abuse lawsuits. But the bishops themselves, they're secure. Their pension's not affected. Some of the priest's pensions may be affected, you know, but they're secure, and they're the ones making all these decisions. It's very unjust. It's We're talking about tra lack of transparency, and there's a reason for that transparency, because as we covered it about, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, Bishop Warfield, I think Paul Warfield, out in Montana, he was totally transparent. He said, look, uh, diocese, uh, we need, I think it's Helena. $20 million. We, tw we yeah. need $20 million, and it's to cover abuse. sex abuse problem. Yeah. Man, you should have read the comments when we covered that story. Well, well a little, what, little what later, he like, wanted, what he wanted no. was, he wanted every parish to voluntarily, you know, um, give 10% of its savings yeah. to pay off the sex, $20 million of sex That's abuse. So well. And the Catholics were like, what? What on earth are you talking about? Well, Why is this on us? Yeah, it, it's absolutely infuriating because at the same time, the bishops, by and large, almost all of them, in my opinion, are committed to the status quo. You know, they, they're they begging yes. for, for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions in some cases uh, from the laity, even as they refuse to purge the seminaries, their parishes, the, their dioceses, uh, religious orders of the root cause of all of See, these. it's that very point, the insurance companies and the faithful in the parishes are both saying the same thing. The insurance companies saying, we, we don't have to pay for this because you guys caused this problem. You guys built this system by which it's all going to fall apart. There's no way we need, we're on yeah. the hook for this. Mm -hmm. And the parishioners are saying the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, the bishops, and something that people say over and over again is just how incredibly tone deaf the bishops <laughs> are because in the midst of the sex abuse stuff, McCarrick, all this stuff, give us money. You know, mm -hmm. capital campaigns all over the place. There are four dioceses right now that they're asking money that total one billion dollars. You've got in, in L.A. Mm -hmm. where Cardinal Mahoney is still very active, you know, c cover up king. They're asking for five hundred million dollars in L.A. Chicago, you've got two hundred forty million dollars. Of course, that's soupage. Um, then New York, something like two hundred thirty million. And then here in Detroit, almost two hundred million. Good news, though, is that Catholics are closing their wallets. Mm -hmm. I know Detroit is not making the money that they want to be making. And they have these beautiful names and slogans, you know, unleash the gospel for, for mm -hmm. Detroit and renew my church in Chicago when they call it, what, shutter, shutter, shutter my, my church. church. <laughs> and what's the one in New York? New York, renew my, uh, no, no, making all things new, but they've changed it, making all things revenue. Yeah. Right. Because that's what right. it's about. And to always keep it top of mind for you, remember this entire crisis is being brought to you by the homo predator clerical abuse scandal. Okay, time for a quick break, but when we return, this week's Militant. Stick around, we'll be right back. To become perfect, pray a rosary a day. Buy The Weapon at churchmilitant.com. Okay, welcome back. Well, today's Monday, one of my favorite days, and of course, um, each day has a special theme that we focus on. Monday, meaning it's time for Militant Monday. This week our militant is Father Richard Bucci from Sacred Heart Parish in Providence, Rhode Island. 
Father Bucci barred a large number of pro-abortion state legislators and other state officials from receiving Holy Communion at his parish. And we're also including his bishop, Thomas Tobin, for backing him up. Good for him. The decree was distributed during a Sunday Mass and also mailed directly to some of the individuals on the list. In addition to Holy Communion, they've been barred from acting as witnesses to marriage, standing up as godparents, and lecturing, quote, at weddings, funerals, or any other church function, close quote. As the spiritual father to the flock at his parish, Father Bucci has not only the right, but the obligation to watch out for the well-being of those within his walls. Receiving Holy Communion in a state of mortal sin, which is certainly the case for those who willfully participate in abortion and proactively promote it by enshrining it in state law, endangers their very souls. Father Dean Perry, a pastor and canonist in the diocese, said he and other Rhode Island priests support Father Bucci's decision, and he told Church Militant, quote, I think that Father Bucci's note will inspire our younger priests to be more bold and steadfast when it comes to the proper reception of Holy Communion, close quote. God bless him, bravo, Absolutely. and you know, how about more bishops doing this? Why is, it, why is it on the priests doing this? No. Why not the bishops doing this? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things Father Bucci was saying was that this is not something I'm doing in a, a, a condemnatory way. Mm -hmm. I'm actually caring for these souls, and it really is. This is an act of love on his part to keep souls, first of all, informed that you're in a state of mortal sin, and that the church is not okay with abortion, and that you're voting for abortion, and the fact that you're re receiving our Lord sacrilegiously for the sake of Christ and your soul, we need to put the brakes on here. Mm -hmm. And this is what canon law is about, and he's applying it in a loving way. He went out and said, I care about your soul. I want you guys. Yeah. Just yeah. like a good I, pastor should yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, yeah. I think it's, I really, I think it's a wake up call. Uh, you know, Rhode Island is statistically the most Catholic state in the nation. Now, practically, it's, it's, I'd say it's majority Protestant because so many Catholics are cafeteria like they are across the country and, and, and across the West. But I, yeah, I, I'm very encouraged by this, you know, the priest and the bishop standing up for Catholic teaching yeah. on the Eucharist. It's virtually a one-party state, you know, yeah. Democrats all along. So he's got to he yeah. put the brakes on. Yep, absolutely. And again, we're bringing you viewer comments today from Rodney Pelletier's commentary for Thursday's download on the USCCB's Democrat platform, viewer LSM1 said about the bishops, they think they are for progress. Ha! Huh. He then quotes C.S. Lewis, we all want progress, but if you're on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. In that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive. And Michael Aiello wrote, it's time for the USCCB to be held accountable for their actions. That means public record of the votes of the bishops. No more hiding behind secrecy. And finally, from Paul's article, The Pope, American Society, and Civil Unions, David Sammons said regarding the LGBT issue, in most cases, it isn't the families that are doing the shunning. On the contrary, most of those that act out on their same-sex attraction or GI inclinations are the ones doing the shunning. Jesus makes it clear in Luke 12, 51, that he did not come to establish peace on the earth. He says, no, I tell you, but rather division. Then he goes on to command us to pick up our cross and follow him. When some pick up their cross and follow him and others do not, division is inevitable. Well said, yeah. very well I, said. I, 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 oh, that's a very important comment he made there about the, let's blow out the secrecy because we want transparency all the way. You mm -hmm. got to go back to the USCCB. How are you voting on yeah, these exactly. things? Exactly. You know, and, and that's that's another thing. You know, I mean, these bishops, and I've said it many times. Many of them are cowards. Mm -hmm. you know, they hide behind secrecy. They don't mean what they say about transparency. If you if you're really transparent, show us how you vote. Mm -hmm. Just recall, 69 bishops voted not to include abortion as a preeminent issue in the voter's guide. And then you go back to 2018 Baltimore conference. You know, you had 137 bishops voting not to have Rome turn over its McCarrick files, mm -hmm. the findings of its investigation. 83 bishops voted in favor of it. Now, I spoke privately to some, some of the bishops there at the Baltimore conference. I know who voted and how. Mm -hmm. But people were like, who? Which, did my bishop vote this way, yes or no? Come on, you know, have it out. Be open We're getting a flood of comments about that. How did my bishop vote? How did my bishop vote? You can't say because it's not a public record. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us. Remember to download is your show for all the news you need to know. You can come to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week at churchmilitant.com. As we get closer to the elections in November, the liberal media forces are working harder than ever to censor and hide the news you need to know. Fight back by becoming a premium subscriber. For $10 a month, you'll have access to all our content to help you know the news. We'll see you again tomorrow right here on The Download. God bless you.